Good morning. Once again, I would ask you please to keep me in your prayers this morning as I speak to you, that God will use me as an instrument of his love. I was born and raised in Utah, the oldest of two children. We were brought up in a nominally religious home, and yet religion played a major part in our lives as we were growing up. My parents were also born and raised in Utah in families with connections back to the early Mormon pioneers who settled the Great Salt Lake Valley in the mid-1800s. My great-great-great-grandfather on my mother's side was probably the first in my family to join the Mormon Church on February 14, 1832, less than two years after Joseph Smith founded the church. Grandpa Alva Benson convinced his wife, father, mother, and the rest of the family to join the church in the winter of 1832. They moved to Jackson County, Missouri in November of 1832, but were driven out of the county by a mob because they were Mormons. In 1834, they were again driven out of um, Clay County, Missouri, where they had joined the uh, main body of the Mormon Church. They were forced out of Clay County by a combination of militia troops and vigilantes after Governor Boggs issued his infamous extermination order on October 27, 1838. The order described the Mormons as being in open and avowed defiance of the laws and of having made war upon the people of this state. It stated that the Mormons must be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state if necessary for the public peace. Their outrages are beyond all description. My family eventually settled in Utah in 1852, about five years after the first Mormon pioneers arrived in the Salt Lake Valley under the leadership of Brigham Young, the successor to Joseph Smith. My grandmother on my father's side was the last of my family to be converted to Mormonism and relocate to Utah from Switzerland. My great-grandparents left for Utah to join seven of their children who had already emigrated. But they were forced to leave my grandmother, Maria Kaufman, behind in the old country because she was infected with tuberculosis. Grandma eventually made the journey with her sister, but only after the TB symptoms had subsided enough for her to slide past the U.S. immigration authorities in New York Harbor. My family was directed by Brigham Young in 1852 to settle in a high mountain area in the Wasatch Range of the Rocky Mountains in northern Utah called Cache Valley. According to my great-great-grandfather's account, he, he wrote, we met the apostle Ezra T. Benson at the point of the mountain. We asked him what the privileges were in the valley, and he said, find the best place that you can. They found a place on the southeast side of the valley called Hiram and established their 20-acre farm with about 12 or 15 other families. All of my extended family, since those early pioneer ancestors, were born and raised as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints also known as the LDS or the Mormons, as they are more commonly known. It was only natural that my sister and I were brought up in the religion as well. Mormonism in Utah was not just a practiced uh, religion on Sundays. It was an absolute way of life. School, social activities, scouting, dancing, music, theater, sports, and much more 
revolved around the church. My parents did not go to church regularly, but they were very adamant that my sister and I not miss out on anything that the church had to offer. They paid their fast offerings and welcomed the visiting home teachers in an effort to maintain their ties with the church and thereby remain in good standing. In those days, anyone who was less than an active member of the church was ostracized by the majority. Approximately 77% of the population of Utah was, and I believe still is, a Mormon. And my parents did not want me or my sister to become one of those unmentionable, disenfranchised others. Mormonism is still thriving in Utah and growing all over the world. The LDS have a very carefully groomed image of family togetherness and steadfast moral values. Mormons believe that strong families make a strong nation, and strong nations make a strong world. They have a program called Family Home Evening, in which each participating family sets aside one evening per week to gather and discuss issues concerning the church. The goal of every faithful Mormon is to go to the temple and to be sealed for time and eternity as a family unit. In order to enter the temple, each individual needs a temple recommendation from his bishop and stake president. The recommend is only granted to Mormons in good standing with the church. For example, those who live the word of wisdom, pay 10% tithing, attend church regularly, and follow all of the rules and precepts of their church. In addition to ministering to their own members, there are over 60,000 young men and women missionaries around the world who dedicate two years of their lives at personal expense and great sacrifice to spread the word about Mormonism to others. The missionary's appeal comes from his or her youthful appearance and enthusiasm and from the social programs the church offers, such as dancing, sports, scouts, and especially genealogy. Most members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have complete and unquestioning trust in all that is Mormon. They believe with all their hearts that their faith represents the only true church on earth. And it is their goal and responsibility to spread that belief to everyone else. As I was growing up, I had very little contact with people outside of the LDS church. The few non-Mormons I knew were viewed as outsiders and were treated somehow differently than the members. Even Mormons who did not attend church regularly or who did not live according to the teachings of the church, were still considered better than the non-members. I experienced this social exclusion firsthand when I decided not to attend the church-sponsored seminary program during my first year of high school. Although it was outside the normal curriculum and even located across the street from the school, almost everyone who was Mormon attended the seminary classes. It was difficult for me to relate to my friends as they exchanged stories about the things they were learning in seminary and the activities that they were involved with. I didn't make that mistake again. I participated in a three-year seminary program rather than the normal four years and I was once again content to find myself included in conversations with my friends. Mormons consider the standard works to be the basis of their doctrine. These four books are the Bible, the King James Version, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. They believe the Bible to be incomplete because many plain and precious parts have been taken away by the great 
an abominable church. The Book of Mormon is regarded as a volume of holy scripture. It supposedly contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel. Joseph Smith described the Book of Mormon as, and I quote, the most correct book of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. The Doctrine and Covenants consist primarily of revelations given to Joseph Smith and is full of instruction for the church regarding Mormon beliefs and practices involving things such as baptisms for the dead, celestial marriage, priesthood, and polygamy. The Pearl of Great Price is a collection of smaller writings and contains the 13 Articles of Faith, a summary of the beliefs of the LDS Church. From the Mormon perspective, there are three basic classifications of Christian churches. First is the Catholic Church, which claims it has an uninterrupted existence since it was originally founded by Jesus Christ. The second are the Protestant churches, founded by reformers who believe that the original church fell into apostasy and that the gospel can re be returned to the teachings and practices of the early church through an intense study of the Bible. The third classification consists of those who believe that the church fell into total apostasy and could not be reestablished through reformation, but only through restoration. I was taught that the Catholic Church was the great and abominable church mentioned in the Book of Mormon. Furthermore, the Catholic Church had intentionally removed the plain and precious parts from the Bible that were essential for a full understanding of the teachings of Christ. As a result, there was a great or total apostasy of the gospel, and it became necessary for the church to be restored by Jesus Christ to Joseph Smith. As a Mormon, it was easier to relate to members of the Protestant churches because they had a common disdain for the Catholic Church. I agreed with the Protestants in the recognition of the Catholic Church as an apostate church, but felt that they had only the incomplete Bible as their source for doctrine. It was easy to use the Bible to support the Mormon position where possible, and then to claim that it was not translated correctly when it conflicted with what I was taught to believe as a Mormon. <clears throat> when I left Utah in 1968 to join the military, the Mormon bishop gave me a, a metal dog tag to wear around my neck. Engraved on one side was a picture of the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City. On the reverse side were the words, I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. When times were hard, I would often wear my dog tags with the Mormon medal as a reminder of my roots and my heritage. It gave me comfort to recall that I was at heart just a simple Mormon boy from Utah, protected from the evils of the world by my family, friends, and my church. Despite the consolation it provided, I became inactive in the Mormon church. About a year later, I met Anna, a Catholic, and we were married by a Catholic priest in Germany in 1971. Our two daughters were raised Catholic under my wife's instruction. For many years, I attended Catholic Mass, often as a musician in the choir. While stationed in San Francisco, I played the guitar at the local army chapel along with a black Baptist piano player. <laughs> I know it's hard to imagine, but... <laughs> and, and we often joked between he and I, the Mormon and the Baptist, that we knew the words to the Mass better than most, most of the Catholics who were in attendance there. 
And he and I would re repeat the words, and, and it, it was quite fun, actually. Um, I continued to proudly proclaim my Mormon affiliation, although I did not attend their services. I had no intention of joining any other church, especially not the Catholic Church. I knew how much it meant to my family back in Utah that I remain a member of the Mormon Church. I dreaded visits from the home teachers from the Mormon Church, but I always made sure that my church records followed me to my du new duty station. I did not let the Mormons get too close to me, afraid that they would talk me into coming back to the church again. I made good friends with another Mormon service member who kept me informed with the latest news from the church. Otherwise, I pretty much kept my distance from the Mormons, comfortable to just sit on the fence. We moved to Virginia in the United States in January of 1993 for an assignment at the Pentagon, and I began attending mass regularly in the Pentagon. We had, a, we had a mass at noontime in the Pentagon. I joined the contemporary choir at our home parish because I enjoyed the music, and I thought it was a nice, neutral way to worship God. When asked to do a newsletter for the Schoenstatt Rosary campaign, I jumped at the opportunity to display my computer talents. <laughs> Through the preparation of the newsletter, I was first introduced to the rosary and to Mary's special role in the life, suffering, and death of Jesus. I couldn't help but be touched by the things that I was reading. I began to ask questions. Anna was, of course, excited about my interest, and she began dropping Catholic literature around the house <laughs> for me to find. I found out later she'd also placed a, a green scapular under our bed. <laughs> What's up with that? I, I, I don't know. In the early part of November of 1993, I asked Anna if she was trying to convert me. She said she wasn't and reminded me that she had never pressured me to become a Catholic. For over 22 years of married life, I had gladly called myself a Mormon, and I told Anna that I had no intentions of becoming a Catholic. I was born a Mormon, I was raised a Mormon, and I'm going to die a Mormon, I exclaimed to her. But something was happening to me. The power of all the prayers that were being said for me by Anna and many others was having an effect. The Holy Spirit was working on me. On November 20th of 1993, I sacrificed a Saturday to attend a seminar given by Scott and Kimberly Hahn. Scott told his story of assuming the role of detective in an attempt to prove once and for all that the Catholic Church was wrong. In the process of his studies, he became a Catholic. I remember, I vividly remember thinking to myself that obviously he didn't do his research very well. <laughs> or he would have become a Mormon instead of a Catholic. So I decided to try the detective thing myself just to prove that the Catholics were wrong and the Mormons were right. And I was going to take that information back to Scott Hahn and bring him into the Mormon church. <laughs> I began reading and researching like there was no tomorrow. I read books on Mormonism, Protestantism, and Catholicism. <laughs> I listened to audio tapes and watched lots of videos. I grabbed at anything I could get my hands on to confirm beyond a shadow of a doubt that the only true church on earth was the one restored by Jesus Christ to the prophet Joseph Smith and his followers. 
much to my chagrin, every direction I turned. And on each point I investigated, I found overwhelming evidence against the Mormon position. The more I researched, the more problems I found with the Mormon doctrines I had been taught. I discovered that the Mormon teaching of the total apostasy in the early church established by Jesus Christ was simply not true. The overwhelming historical evidence available supports the Catholic teaching on apostolic succession. It was first demonstrated in the replacement of Judas by Matthias in Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 26. The chain has been unbroken from Peter to Pope John Paul II. Without a great and total apostasy, there is no need for a restoration. Another truth I uncovered through my research is that there is only one God. I could no longer accept the basic Mormon principles such as the plurality of gods made flesh and bones, God's humanity, and man's progression to an exalted God of his own world. Through the mystery of the Holy Trinity, I began to understand the one divine nature of God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Lastly, I came to know that God is the first cause of everything, and that our souls and bodies are created at the moment of conception. I could no longer accept the Mormon plan of eternal progression, consisting of a premortal existence where each person is born into this world according to his previous merits in the spirit world. I started to believe that nothing exists that does not owe its existence to God the Creator. The next logical step was to realize that Mary was created as the most exalted creature on earth. I began to see her as the daughter of God the Father, the spouse of God the Holy Spirit, and the mother of God the Son. I saw that through a better understanding of the virtues of the Blessed Virgin, we can more nearly follow in the footsteps of Jesus. By Christmas, I was absolutely convinced that the, that the Mormons were wrong. I was devastated. How could so many people be deceived? What about all the sacrifices my ancestors made for the church? How could I turn my back on my heritage? my upbringing, my family, and my childhood friends. I wanted to pretend that I had never started on this journey. I wished I could go back to the way things were, but it was too late. I had found the truth. Once I had decided that I wanted to become a Catholic, I had a wonderful feeling of peace because I knew that I was doing the right thing. I was certain that God was prompting me along the way and giving me the grace to open my mind and heart to accept the truth of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. At the same time, there was a tremendous battle raging around me that left me wondering what was going to happen next. I was challenged from all directions in what seemed like a concerted effort to prevent me from trusting in God. The spiritual warfare even manifested itself physically. One morning, about two weeks after my baptism, another driver ran into the back of my car on the way to work. I was verbally attacked by members of my family in Utah and some of my coworkers in the Pentagon. On Ash Wednesday, I was heckled by my supervisor for having dirt on my forehead. 
the distractions and obstacles seemed constant and unrelenting. I just kept reminding myself that I must be on the right track since all of these bad things were being thrown at me. I accepted my sufferings as the devil's desperate attempt to steer me away from the church. Not to be outdone, God gave me some loving affirmations that he was there with me. One evening at church, I was overcome with joy and drawn uncontrollably to an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. I genuflected towards the tabernacle and made the sign of the cross for the first time in my life. Also on Ash Wednesday, just days before my baptism, I had a very moving experience confirming the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. During my first confession the next day, I had another nudge that assured me of the authority of the Pope as the successor to Peter and the Vicar of Christ. By that time, I had no problem discerning which combatant was sending the good messages and which was sending the negative ones. On the 19th of February, 1994, I received the holy sacraments of baptism, confirmation, penance, first communion, and validation of the sacrament of matrimony performed over 22 years earlier. It was a sacred day that I'll cherish forever. I want to talk a little bit about the um, sacrament of the Lord's Supper from the, the Mormon uh, perspective. Mormons believe that Jesus instituted the sacrament or the ordinance of the gospel as the symbol of his atoning sacrifice. The bread of the sacrament is a symbol of the Savior's broken flesh. The wine is a symbol of his spilled blood. Mormons do not believe that the bread is the actual flesh of Christ, nor do they believe the wine is his actual blood. In partaking of the sacrament, the Mormons renew sol solemn covenants made with the Lord. It is blessed by members of their lesser Aaronic priesthood, usually young men between the ages of 16 and 18. The sacrament is only for members of the church. Liquids other than wine and food other than bread may be used as emblems in the observance of the sacrament. Even though they could use virtually any matter, the Mormons use regular leavened bread. They have substituted water for the wine because of their health restrictions on the use of alcohol. These health restrictions are contained in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 89, called the Word of Wisdom. As a young boy, I was a member of the lesser Aaronic priesthood. The greater priesthood is called the Melchizedek priesthood. Within the Aaronic priesthood, there are three levels, deacons, teachers, and priests. Within the Melchizedek priesthood, there are elders and high priests. It is a male-only priesthood. Members of the Aaronic priesthood attend to matters pertaining to the temporal affairs and the temporal welfare of the people such as baptizing new members, administering the sacrament, attending to the tithing and fast offerings, looking after the poor, and taking care of the properties of the church. Members of the Melchizedek priesthood are the ruling, presiding, and governing authority in the church. They administer primarily in the spiritual matters of the church. As a member of the Aaronic priesthood, I prepared the bread and water for the sacrament. I distributed the sacrament to other members. I collected fast offerings, which is a, a monetary contribution to be given in place of the food not eaten as a result of fasting. And I did that once a month. I also visited the homes of members along with a Melchizedek priesthood holder as a 16-year-old priest. I would pray the words that were 
um, used for the blessing of the emblems of the sacrament. The bishop, which is the Mormon equivalent to our parish priest, would listen very carefully to the words that these young men would um, say over the, the sacrament to make sure that we used the words exactly the way we were supposed to say them and exactly the way they were written. If we missed even one word, the bishop would shake his head. We'd have to look back at the bishop. He would shake his head, and we'd have to go back and start all over again. Um, it, it was quite an experience, but if you can imagine a 16-year-old boy um, doing the blessing, it, it's, uh, it's different. Um, I wanted to go into the, um, the Catholic understanding of the Holy Eucharist, but um, for time purposes, I don't really have the time to go into that. Plus, the early church fathers uh, spent a lot of time talking about the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So I would encourage each of you to go back to John chapter 6 and spend time reading and meditating on John chapter 6, where you will find the Catholic understanding of the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist and um, contemplate on that and share that information with others. John chapter 6. The Catholic Church has always taught that Jesus Christ is truly present, body and blood, soul and divinity, in the Holy Eucharist through the mystery of transubstantiation. Compare this with the Mormon teaching that the bread and wine, the water, are merely emblems or symbols. However, to complicate things, in the Book of Mormon, 3 Nephi, chapter 18, verses 28 to 29, it warns us not to partake of the flesh and blood of Christ unworthily. So which is it in the LDS Church? A symbolic action to be done in remembrance of Christ? Or is it actually the body and blood of Christ? Death came into the world through the sin of Adam. Bread is first mentioned in the Old Testament when God gives punishment to Adam. In the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread. That comes from Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. Scripture again uses the word bread in conjunction with the word wine. Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, which is Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine, for he was a priest of the Most High God. This is in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. It is significant that God mentions bread in his punishment of Adam because the new Adam, Jesus Christ, in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, identifies himself as the bread of life. In the book of Hebrews, we read that Jesus has become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Like Melchizedek, Jesus is the king of Jerusalem and a high priest of God who offers bread and wine. Christ continues through his Catholic priests to offer the sacrifice of his body and blood under the appearance of bread and wine according to the order of Melchizedek. It is at the Last Supper that Jesus clarifies what he spoke of earlier during his ministry. He is the true bread of angels. Christ gives us his body, blood, soul, and divinity under the taste and appearance of a meal of bread and wine. Through faith, we recognize that the Holy Eucharist only appears to be bread. They recognized him in the breaking of the bread. I'm going to jump jump past the early church fathers, many, many citations from the early church fathers that I encourage you again to go back and read the early church fathers to see what they had to say about these things that are uniquely Catholic, especially the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. When I looked at the early church fathers and their writings, after almost 23 years of attending Catholic Mass and then finally reading the early church fathers, I, I saw the Catholic Church. 
I mean, there was no doubt in my mind that that was the Catholic Church that was being practiced by the very earliest Christians. There are many examples from the early church fathers concerning the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist under the appearances of bread and wine. LDS indifference to the actual substance of the Eucharist has made possible the variation in the Mormon sacramental practice of substituting water for wine. Let us give thanks to God for his mercy and love. He has given his church the greatest gift imaginable, the sacrament of the altar, the very own body and blood, soul and divinity of our dearly beloved Lord Jesus Christ. This gift unites us to Christ and unites us to one another in Christ's mystical body, the church. However, it comes with a great responsibility on the part of Catholics. We must teach its truth to others. Mormons, Protestants, and non-Christians, so that we may all share in the heavenly banquet and break bread together for all of eternity. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, because the loaf of bread is one, we, though many, are one body for we all partake of the one loaf. Thank you very much and God bless you.